Welcome to a Germs Journey News Desk, an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications. Find out more about a Germs Journey at our website, germsjourney.com, or find us on Twitter at Germs Journey. Okay, so hello everyone, um, and it's, it's going to be an interesting session, isn't it? So I think what we are planning to do today is to kind of um, go through the Germs Journey, really, the Germs Journey project, and what we have here is kind of a, um, um, you know, looking forward to this multidisciplinary team that we have here as well. Um, so I think the idea um, for a Germs Journey came about when uh, microbiologist Dr. Katie Lard was trying trying to teach her young son about germs and hand washing. So I think we will start from that point. And then, uh, of course, we will come to Professor Sarah Uni, who have been uh, bringing in her expertise around education and how we can blend in um, to work with the children, but also lots to learn, actually. So um, can I can I just um, start with but just asking, um, what is the uh, story behind this project? Um, well, when I had my son, as most mothers of little boys of three or four know, um, they're, they're mucky little pups and um, Jacob particularly liked playing with his cars around the toilet seat and didn't like washing his hands and just had a fascination um, with those types of things. So I was trying to explain to him as a microbiologist about germs, but obviously that concept is quite difficult because we can't see them, they're invisible. Um, it's a little bit like climate change. So I looked to find a book that would be able to teach um, or help me teach Jacob about um, germs. And unfortunately there didn't seem to be anything age aimed at that very young age group so that sort of early years that foundation stage where pictures were really important for their learning etc so I saw there was a gap in the market and I am obviously a scientist and I completely understood the science that I needed to put across to Jacob to make him healthy but I very quickly realized that I wasn't going to be able to do this alone and that I needed an education expert on board who would be able to take the science and say how best to put it across to young children. So that's when I um, reached out to Sarah, um, who we will hear from in a second, and we become um, co-founders of A Germ's Journey. And as we'll hear today, that journey has involved Medina Publishing, who have been key to getting the books um, out to children. But also, as Rob previously mentioned, the whole co-creation ethos is fundamental to, to the project as well. I think that's, that's very interesting, isn't it? So I think co-creation is something that can actually build in some unique experience within a project. So um, lots of people, you know, as they have been, I've been introducing this project to many people and having that, that kind of um, long discussions around why this project is unique. And um, I think I have got my response to it, but I would like to um, get uh, Professor Sarah Uni um, into it and, and, and see how, how you feel about the uniqueness. Uh, thanks, Indriani. So when Katie approached me, um, I was also a mother and my children were slightly older than Katie. So I'd been through the potty training period with both mine, a boy and a girl, and I found them both to be equally, as Katie said, <laughs> mucky pups. And um, I taught them about the importance of hand washing and it was really interesting and my childminder to this day talks about this story how she, the childminder had Ofsted visit and the Ofsted um, obviously watched how the childminder was doing hygiene and going to the toilet and he saw my two-year-old was washing her hands and he said 
the Ofsted inspector said to my two-year-old, so I can see you're washing your hands. Yes, she said. And he said, do you know why you're doing that? And she turned around and said, yes, to wash away the germs, of course. <laughs> he just said, I don't know any two-year-olds that would know that. So I was very on board with Katie's idea because I knew that that came from me talking to my daughter. But I knew that my child mind actually didn't have any books on it. So when Katie said about this, I said, yes, you're absolutely right. There is a gap in the market. And we also need to help all the other parents and the carers and the childminders and the nursery workers about how we can help them with this aspect of hygiene. So when we came up with the idea of a book, we knew that it had to be really done in a particular way that would be engaging and captivating to really young children because they can't read. So they can't read words like germs and even less understand the concept because, as Katie said, germs are actually invisible. So we knew that the way forward would be with um, graphics and using images and making those really bright and colourful for children. And we also wanted to hide the germs. And to do that, we had some black paint known as thermochromatic paint put on front of the Germs Journey book, which actually hid the germs underneath the paint and when you rubbed the paint it actually disappeared because the heat friction made the paint go away and you could see the germs emerge from under the paint so that helped us translate that concept of just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there and we're absolutely delighted to have Peter and Jules and Hannah here because Medina were the publishers that enabled us to bring this innovative concept to life. And um, we're really grateful for them going ahead with the book and this thermochromatic paint that was developed. Fantastic. And I think that's that's where um, possibly I'll, I'll go to Hannah and Peter, you know, as you want to uh, pick this up. Um, so what is it that you found unique um, that you thought, um, well, yes, we need to get this published? Well, it's a good question, and uh, thanks for inviting us. And Hannah could give her perspe perspectives as a younger member of the team and a newer member of the team. I was a founder of Medina, and we've done a lot of work in the Middle East. We, we are, com are commissioned to do books for Gulf states. We're currently engaged with the Expo World Trade Fair, which is forthcoming in Dubai. We have five books for the World Fair under preparations, including a book on for children and, and sustainability in the visitor's guide. So when I when previous to this, um, when I saw this project, it fascinated me in the sense of its universality. And also with the cross-cultural dimensions, knowing that Leicester is itself in a very multi-ethnic part of the country, we have rebased our offices to the Isle of Wight, which is a very different demographic. But our work in the Middle East revealed to me First of all, the fact that there are aspects to cleanliness and washing, et cetera, that, that are cross-cultural. So in other words, the ritual of washing wudu in, in, uh, amongst uh, Muslims opened up fascinating prospects for cross-cultural outreach. Um, so I could see that this as a universal project and one that engaged uh, children um, in a multi-ethnic uh, background could be a very, very fascinating uh, project to get involved in. And of course, um, sadly, in many ways, events have proved that to be more than the case. At that time, we were looking at bacterial infection, and then there was talk of um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. But then, of course, we know what came along, and that, that took off with the second book on Bye Bye Germs. Um, Hannah then became involved, and I like her perspective. She, she's new to the project and from a different generation, so that's given us the opportunity to take publishing into social media. Um, but what fascinates me is the partnerships, co-creation, as you've mentioned, multidisciplinary aspects of the, uh, of the project, and also outreach to stakeholders. Since we started the project, we've relocated the Isle of Wight, and we've also set up a bookshop. So as a publisher, we're now a bookshop as well. And that gives us forward-facing opportunities to engage with the readership. So we find that that's a very interesting perspective to have. We publish, but we also um, are a community bookshop and we have reach into uh, local schools and the community. But I'd like Hannah to give her impressions as, as new to the project as well. 
Oh, uh, hi. Um, thanks for allowing me to join. It's, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so I came board with the project around March of this year and joined Medina in February as a marketing assistant. Um, for me, it made absolute sense. And I was thrilled when Peter asked me to uh, help market this project and these books. Um, they're certainly books, as has been mentioned previously, that I never saw as a child. And I'm all too aware of, you know, the, especially in the light of the pandemic, how a government top down communication doesn't land the same with everybody. So it's so important that especially young children and children of different kind of backgrounds um, get that very personalized communication. Um, uh, part of my role has been uh, reaching out to schools on the island, especially to um, see how the they've been receptive to the books and see kind of. Uh, you know, what the children have been doing, how they've been responding, getting feedback for De Montfort University. And we're very excited recently. Um, we had a fantastic school on the island called St. Catharines who work with uh, disabled children. And they recently, the children there, I think it was in year five, produced some fantastic artwork in response to the books. And that just shows the impact that they're having. And my role is to act as that messenger to convey that feedback back to the project in order to make it stronger um, and order to help make sure that the books is disseminated uh, as far as and wide as possible. Um, and another thing I've been working on and we're in the planning stages of is producing a lovely reading video for children as another way to kind of interact with the text. Um, one thing that I've come across in my experience so far working with social media, working in marketing um, and at university, having graduated last year, is the importance of making sure information is accessible. Um, so it made sense to me to suggest when I came on board to the project, the idea of having a sign language interpreter involved in these videos um, and in order to make sure that deaf children have other ways of accessing uh, media and resources relating to the project. So that's something I'm working very closely with in terms of um, DMU comms team to bring to life and Jules, the illustrator, to use kind of colour and lots of interactive a schema to make that happen and it's interesting promoting it on social media because um, once people see it it makes sense in their heads and it's not a question it's my child needs to know this and I think this is some tale after the pandemic it will always be important it will always be relevant and it will you know as Peter has suggested increase in importance with antimicrobial resistance and other health challenges. So for me, it's a fantastic project to be involved in and I'm having a great time playing a part in creating that impact. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I can I can hear that passion in that uh, voice, you know, kind of, I kind of um, see your involvement there as well. Um, and, and it's a good kind of transition point to come to Jules about it. And, um, you know, so, um, First of all, I'm very much, I love your YouTube channel. Uh, it's a great one to learn things. And, and of course, you know, lots of schools have picked up on your uh, YouTube channel, which is fantastic. Um, if I ask you, like, how did you visualize this project? And um, can you let us know a little bit more about your thoughts when you were illustrating uh, for the book? Yeah, so um, I think it had a particular resonance for me because I was actually recovering from COVID um, when I got the phone call from, from Medina. So um, I was, you know, I, I could um, understand from a completely different perspective what was needed. Um, and also because I'm, my, I, I'm sort of specialising in producing picture books, I write and illustrate picture books and also books for slightly older children up to about nine or ten, um, but predominantly picture books. And I, I could see what both um, DMU and Medina wanted out of this because it needed to be a... Um, it needed to be something that was accessible to young children. So like Sarah was saying, they, they're not necessarily reading um, many words, uh, you know, perhaps a little when they're in reception, but they needed enough to be able to pick up on the visual clues of the illustrations and get the message as well through some of the words or just listening to the narrative. It needed to be quite simple. Um, and it needed to be, I felt it needed to be um, 
accessible to a, as wide a demographic as possible. So when I started to think about the characters, um, I was thinking about um, perhaps two brother and sister who, so that, you know, from the very start, we've got something that's not gender specific. So we've got both sexes. Um, and I was thinking about where they, what their ancestry might have been. So perhaps who their parents are. And initially, I had the idea of having um, a younger mum who has darker skin. Um, so one of the children has darker skin and also an older father. So um, you've got that sort of um, blended family as well of perhaps having a, an age difference. In the end, we decided to just go with mum, uh, sort of partly because it simplified things. But also we didn't sort of want people to wonder who who the, the man in the story, what, well, you know, is that granddad? I don't, I don't kind of understand what's going on here. So we, we kind of, um, we retired the dad and we just kept mum and the two children. And then it needed to be, we sort of worked together. And this was all in the early days of, of the first lockdown. So during, I think most of it was, was completed during March of 2020. Um, a lot of the concepts and between Sarah, Katie, myself and Medina, we we kind of put all our ideas together. And of course, Sarah and Katie did all the, the scientific side of it and told me what needed to be said. And then I offered my thoughts and feelings about the concept of the pictures and the narrative. And we also we talked about the um, the title of the book because I wasn't involved with um with the initial Germ's Journey book, but we knew this, this next one was much more sort of COVID based. So um, we, we, uh, we sort of bumped around a lot of ideas for titles. Um, and then uh, just sort of the layout as well, that, that needed to be sorted out um, quite early on so that we knew that there were gonna be lots of um, bubbles with, with thoughts and tips for parents to to uh, go back to uh, a page or two pages where Katie and Sarah had um, put hints and tips for parents to use, and so not necessarily for the children. Um, and all this needed to come together. So it was quite um, an, a sort of a long time of research and development. Um, and then, of course, bringing together the illustrations and the text and all the rest of it so yeah it was quite it was it was a very interesting project to be part of and um uh something that i think is absolutely vital in schools thank you that's great yeah and i think you know at this stage like of course i mean that brings us to kind of think about possibly or, or know from you on the project that um what what is the age group that we are looking for primarily here is it the primary schools or the secondary schools? Is there a um, specific age group that we're looking at? Maybe Katie or Sarah? And on that, the original book was very much based on nursery schools, FS. Um, and so we developed the book with those children in mind. And that feeds into what Sarah was saying about illustrations being absolutely key. And we did a lot of co-creation with teachers, et cetera. We took the book to India, the UK version then, um, and co-created with um, Madna Savna, which is a charity that works with children, and also with the Environmental Sanitation Institute. And what we found there is the book was for a much wider age range of children. Um, we then went on to develop the book for West Africa. So Sarah and Sapphire, who's um, been absolutely key to this project, I'm sure Sarah would agree on that, um, has held it together. She's our researcher on it, um, went to Sierra Leone. And again, they developed the book um, which the age range out there was wider. We saw a lot of different concepts. So in the UK, the children understood what the germ was, but didn't really know how to wash their hands. We call it tickle fingers because they literally sort of wiggle their fingers under the tap and think they've washed their hands. Whereas in India and Sierra Leone, they had a much better understanding of having to wash their hands, but didn't understand the germs. So Medina worked with us and, um, develop these books for these other regions as well, which um, I'm sure Peter will have 
tell you about was exceptionally challenging in getting the delivery of these books to some quite rural areas as well. So it was real teamwork. And I think something we haven't mentioned is that we've donated most of these books. So in total, there's been 3,000 books donated across three continents. And then the Bye Bye Germs book, when it was first developed, as Jules said, it was in that first lockdown, um, was made freely available by Medina um, to anyone in those first few months. Or an ebook was uh, made freely available to anyone who needed it, so teachers, parents, healthcare workers. It went out over the Isle of Wight. So this was really important. It was everyone coming together to, for the greater good, basically. And since then, we've had a large donation from Barclays, which has allowed a thousand books of Bye Bye Germs again to be distributed across the UK to help schools. Um, and we are aiming at lower primary with the Bye Bye Germs book, maybe slightly older than just the sort of uh, nurseries and FS. So I don't know if Sarah wants to pick on, Peter wants to pick up on some of the work that we've done overseas and the donation of the books. If I could just jump in there with uh, with Katie's remarks there, yeah, the the uh, an interesting aspect of the project was our repurposing, going back to what Jules was saying when we were in the early stages of developing the illustrative material. It, we we asked Jules as far as possible to be um, sort of flexible in the approach, so it's it could be a plug and play, so that. Um, components of illustrations could be repurposed for wherever the audience was targeted. And that was a very good example with, with the Emirates uh, Middle East, where our representative there managed to get Detol, which is part of Reconcer, uh, Record and Benkasia, the global sort of health company uh, and product company. They supported a limited edition in the UAE in English and we were able with Jules to sort of swerve the content, the illustrative content to the culture of um, the Emirates. And that, was, that, that has been very, very successful. On the back of that, we've used the funding to have a translation into Arabic because it's when we can get the book into a foreign language that you really do reach out to the nationals of that country rather than just the, the overeducated, in a sense, kids or the expatriate kids, what we're targeting now are the um, hundreds of millions of, of Arab speakers. And that will again need repurposing because of the different uh, approaches of different Arab countries. So there's huge potential there. And also another market which we've tried to break into and look at to try to get interest is China, um, which again, in terms of uh, prospects for publishing Chinese readily do take uh, Western produced books, but we, because of the approach we've used with the design, and uh, as Jules pointed out, this is sort of multidisciplinary, that design can be um, adjusted and purposed for the target audience, um, either culturally, religiously, um, whatever, so that the, the, the audience are seeing a book that relates to their lifestyle. Um, and that takes us to co-creation, whether these uh, designs should be almost open source so that you can empower communities to take on this and adjust it the way they want with the kind of, uh, not supervision, but with the inputs of the specialists like yourself, the educational specialists like Sarah. Um, and I think that's where the project does potentially have huge uh, prospect. We're hoping now to have um, Ministry of Education in Saudi Arabia look at it because that's a very, very youthful population. 60% of the population are under the age of 25. And um, with a population of 30 million, we would, could and should get support. And also countries like um, the Gulf states um, all have big outreach programs into other um, territories around the world. So we, we're hoping on the back of the English edition and on the back of the Detol sponsored edition in the UAE in English to get some traction on foreign languages. And plus, of course, the work you've already uh, spurred in India with the Gujarati population. So there's huge prospects. And then also the come home prospects because these are multicultural 
um, targets. And we live in a multicultural society right here and more, more than ever in, in Leicester. Um, I think there are a lot of prospects culturally, ethnically, and in terms of the target message of the book. It's a fascinating project. One other thing on demographics is I don't think we should forget the fact that um, the the lessons trying to be taught here or put over apply to all generations. And also one ask, one one thing that appeals to us because of the demographics of the Isle of Wight being an older demographic, um, there are uh, many people living with dementia. So the approach of the germs book to those living with dementia is very appropriate. But the content and the messaging needs to be adjusted to an adult living with dementia. So there's, there are interesting challenges there and prospects which we would like to get involved in. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, that's that's quite unique, you know, and as you were saying that, I was thinking that, yes, I mean, multiple languages, um, of course, using that book in multiple languages would have make, made it even much uh, possibly um, reach wise. It can give us lots more, um, even if you're looking into the international market, but also in Leicester. Because, um, you know, the, the, there is a part where we can possibly uh, test it out on ground here. And then, of course, because of the diasporic communities and the connections that they have globally, um, that can be really a good one for this project, isn't it? Um, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, trying to get this um, out from Sarah. Um, how did you how did you feel like? You know, when you were designing, of course, thinking about the concept and all of that, how did you identify the, the gap in education or what needs to be communicated when there are like lots of, um, say, for example, YouTube videos? Uh, possibly aren't very much top down approach, but, you know, how how difficult or easy was it for you? Sorry, Indrana, you were saying about... Um... That cut off there, isn't it? Yeah, so it, it's about how did you identify that gap in education? Like, you know, how did you... Where did, where did you um, see that gap in uh, yes. education? And... So um, we do something called um, translational research, which is whereby you literally translate research that's been undertaken um, in universities, and you translate that into everyday practice and out into the public. So this is part of the university's work around public good. So translational research is that commitment to say research shouldn't be in a little ivory tower or hermeneutic circle. Once we found things that are really important and Katie's work in microbiology and uh, germ transfer, we know we have to get that out to the wider public. So I think Peter's right. It's not just about children because we know that when we have those books with children, they're also targeted at the grown ups, at the adults, at the carers, at the teachers, at the health workers in the community centers that we've worked out with in India and West Africa and Sierra Leone. So you're kind of doing a double whammy. You're educating the children and the grown ups at the same time. So we've made sure in both the books, the Clean Hands Germs Journey, first book around germ transfer and hand washing, and the second book around Bye Bye Germs, which is looking much more at viruses and respiratory issues and how germs get, and viruses in particular, form in droplets, and then how sneezes and coughs can make those germs transfer. So we've got the two books there. We knew that as well as doing the really graphic visual aids to help the children, we also needed questions and some suggested interactions that the grown-ups can do with the children while looking at the book together. So both books contain what we call um, scaffolding at the back, where we are making suggestions of how the adult that's with the child, as I said, it could be the nursery worker, it could be the parent, it could be the grandparent. We have some suggestions of questions they can ask the children about the book and about the content so that you get what we call dialogic learning as well. So you get the talking about the book and the ideas and the scientific concepts. So then we are translating the science and those concepts into the hands of children and the adults that are with them. So this works off the theories of, um, in terms of education and learning theories, we're talking about Vygotsky's here zone of approximal development, sometimes called ZPD. This is where a more expert other 
is able to bring on the learning of another who is less expert. And in here, we're really talking about teacher, parent and child. And I'm really interested in Peter's idea about how we can also repurpose what we've done here for adults with dementia, because we actually know that dementia is, is a, a very important issue and is affecting a, an enormous number of elderly people. So I'm very interested to, to develop that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, was it easy to kind of think about how you're going to communicate about what you're communicating uh, to the public? So how did you make that decision um, on what are the kind of words do you need to use? Uh, what are the words that will fit in with, um, you know, appropriately with the illustrations that Jules has done? Yes. So it's kind of a whole lot of uh, considerations. So Yes, um, it is. And yeah. you're right. And the way we did that was to work collaboratively with stakeholders from the very, very beginning. So as Jules said, by having those very early discussions about what's the joint purpose here, what is it that we want to achieve? We made sure from the very beginning we had for the very first book, we had focus groups with our stakeholders. We then worked, as I said, very closely with Medina. But the point of this collaborative way of working with stakeholders is that you want the end users to play a participant role in the project and the process of creating the resources together. So for us, we call this co-creation and it's really important because it's bottom up. So when we went out to Sierra Leone, it was really important that we weren't saying, oh, look, we're here to show you how to wash your hands as white people, because that's actually really offensive. It's to say, actually, how can we work together? How can we work with you? What kind of images would work here when we're looking at representing toilets or representing food or representing sources of water? Because they're very different in West Africa, just as they are very different to the very deprived areas of the cities we were working with in India. So for us, by having that co-creation model and to work collaboratively, it's about getting user buy-in from the very, very beginning. And it gives voice to those that are participating and they have a say in the resources. They can have a voice about how they look. So participants don't feel done to and were not then part of what is sometimes referred to as the white saviour narrative. So it's also about deconstructing colonialist discourses about white people telling other cultures what to do and how to do it. So it's also about undoing that legacy of imperialism as well. So we're not saying here's how to do it, but rather we're saying, can we work out together what is the best way to do this so that it's based on mutual empowerment? It's about sharing ideas and learning from one another. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and there is a cultural element there as well, isn't it? So kind of learning from the culture to how you are actually pitching your concept, but also how that's going to impact on their behavior. You know, that's quite important as well. So this change mechanism uh, possibly needs a much more detailed um, sort of mapping uh, where you're looking into, okay, so I was, I was actually listening to some of the discussions beforehand that we were having today at the news desk. And um, there were discussions around, you know, it, it's, it's also the question availability of resources. So, um, at a place where people are more used to using ashes to wash their hands because they don't have access to water, um, it, those are the places possibly where you're going to face that challenge of accepting the narrative around the germs journey, isn't it? So I'm just thinking that there is a cultural element, there are challenges, uh, communication challenges, and how have you... What, what have you thought about that and how are you planning to do that mapping? So what we do is we work with those communities, which is why um, we actually took students as well, because we believe that part of university's work, as I said, is about public good. And our students are also the co-collaborators with us on the project. So Sapphire was undertaking research. We brought along Charlie, who undertook the use of photography so that we could actually take photos of local communities and what their sources of water are, as you've said rightly. In some cases, it might be the use of ashes. And by taking those photos and then 
and asking the children to also draw pictures. So we've also got a Gujarati version of the um, Germ's Journey book that has a children's illustration at the front of it. But it is by having that narrative and that discussion with the stakeholder groups that we make sure that the images are culturally relevant and that the participants really have a voice in how those images are created. And we negotiate with Jules about how that can be then translated. Again, this notion of translational research into images that are relevant. And when we were working with the UOA version, we were able to look at the images, discuss them. Did we want to make changes? So it is, it's about that ongoing negotiation with your key stakeholders. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that brings me to Katie um, regarding, you know, as a microbiologist uh, working with the creative industry and of course working and, and learning more on the educational models and all of that, how interesting was that? And, and how, I mean, what do you think about the messages, the communications, was it challenging? Was it easier? Um, how did that all blend in from a microbiologist's perspective? Um, it's been a very rapid learning journey <laughs> and I've had great mentors in uh, Sarah and Sapphire who have have taught me an immense amount about the educational theories. But I think that works both both ways because I think the approach that um, Sarah and I take is quite different. As a scientist, I'm very factual based. I'm very, um, how do we measure this? What's the impact? Where's the data? And I think so together as a team, I think that blends us really well. And I think what we have done in the last few years is not only created these resources, but we've assessed the impact of the resources. Um, so we've spoken about a lot about the books, but we have a lot of online resources that are freely available at the point of access for um teachers, healthcare workers around the world. But what we have shown is that the resources change children's hand washing behaviours. We did a big study of over 500 children along with the psychology team at DMU. We've got an exhibition in the Think Tank Museum in Birmingham, the Science Museum. So we were able to assess the impact of an instant song version of hand washing. Um, and we've shown a significant increase in children's understanding in India, Africa and the UK. And in, most importantly for Sarah and I, when we were the last trip, when we were in um, Ahmedabad in uh, India, just before COVID hit, we just got back before it all started, was that there's been over the three years, there's been a reduction in childhood illness um, in the slums and that they've also been teaching their parents and grandparents, etc., about hand washing. If I can add to what Katie and Sarah have just said as well, uh, one of the challenges I think we have with the project is because it is multidisciplinary, there are various kind of, let's not say agendas, but operational methodologies in the sense that a university is different from a company, uh, although the commercial world is hitting universities pretty hard on at the moment. But as a company, we are legally obliged to trade at a profit in other words, we are not a charity. And I think one of the big challenges here is to try to make this project commercially viable in the sense that um, we want it to succeed. Nothing better for a publisher or for a researcher, people like Katie and Sarah and the university, to see a success. And success in terms of publishing is simply one thing. It's volume of sales. And the word sales comes in because... I, again, we are a publishing company. We have to trade at a profit legally. So this is, a, a to me, a big challenge. Is one that's not really been addressed fully. We've tinkered at it from the side. But if we look at, say, for example, Reckitt Bankers, which is a UK-based corporation, multinational, headquartered in Slough, the results for its hygiene division this year are up 21%. The profits for this quarter, last quarter, were of that hygiene division, only hygiene division, were 1.64 billion, billion with a B, pounds. Now, if, if you can imagine just a tiny, tiny percentage of that revenue being funneled into this project uh, and taking away some of the commercial risks and being able to escalate the whole project, then you could see real results. 
But at the moment, we're sort of tinkering around, trying to, do we move ahead? Do we take a risk on this? Do we pay for the project to go a step further? And I think this is one thing that a university particularly has the credentials plus the research backing to actually step forward. We as a publisher could, but they would recognize us as coming forward on a commercial with a commercial hat on. But a university with the leverage you have in your community and within the academic world and the research base gives this a real opportunity to try to tap um, companies that are actually uh, profiting, not in a negative way, but, but are seeing results that are positive as a result of the pandemic and therefore should be returning something to a sort of circular economy, sustainable economy. So I think that is one challenge I would love to see addressed um, so that we can propel this project forward with some serious funding, because that's what it needs to actually engage. Um, if you want to move into video, all this, all these have costs, social media, marketing, production, and uh, multi-language linguistic translations. They either need support um, in the way of subsidies, which are increasingly difficult to get from government um, with the cutback in aid. But I think it needs corporate support. And I, I, I would really look like to examine how we could do that jointly, how we could sort of tap um, corporations and buy, get them to buy in. Because again, the reach of these corporations with their own marketing is enormous. If you take a product like Dettol, um, it's across pretty well every country in the world. It's a known brand. and It points directly to hygiene. So that, that would be something I'd put on the table as a discussion point for, to, to propel this project further. And I think it does really deserve the success of all the specialists who've gone behind us. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's also part of um, the corporate social responsibility, which lots of, um, you know, organizations, of course, during this time, they have come on to kind of build on things or uh, have identified gaps and then kind of invested in it. So there is a huge potential. And um, I think that, you know, of course, multiple languages is going to possibly enhance that reach. Um, buying into not only just the national um, or, or the, you know, uh, multinational organizations, but also the organizations in a more um, sort of country specific way as well. So identifying those can also uh, possibly um, bring in more uh, investment to this project. Um, I'm, I'm just curious on that point to kind of come back to Jules about um, how do you visualize this project going in the future with your creative eyes and, and your thoughts? And, um, you know, how much have um, the illustrations or profits that you have come up with have achieved during this time? You know, we have talked about the impact in cognitive terms. We have talked about the impact in, um, you know, behavior change and all of that. But we have not talked about that creative sense, which you can let us know about. Um, would you like to give us a little bit insight into that? Yeah, well, we're, we're currently working on um, some video work. So um, uh, a sort of read through that schools will be able to use. Um, and also things like um, giving children some tuition on drawing various different uh, germs, whether they're viruses or bacteria or um fungus of some description you know that all of these things you know they they can become more aware of um what they're dealing with because uh, as was already pointed out these things are invisible so when you're when you're talking about a concept to a, a four or five year old you know it's it's very difficult for them to grasp that so having something very physical that perhaps a coloring page that they can color in and um learn some fun facts about um, I mean, there's scope for all sorts of things. If you think about uh, how a big company like Coca-Cola has, you know, they don't just stick with let's make a poster about it. They've gone everywhere. You know, uh, they've even taken over Father Christmas. So there is so much scope for doing things, jigsaws or badges or um, uh, creating animations, all sorts of things. So creatively, there is a lot. Um, uh, to look forward to, I including what, what Peter was saying about um, older people, perhaps with dementia, um, 
uh, and sometimes not older people as well, you know, uh, uh, young uh, adult onset dementia as well. Um, perhaps changing the narrative slightly, keeping the same message, um, changing the illustrations to not just children, but perhaps older people. You know, you can do exactly the same thing that we've achieved with young children. You can uh, make that a much wider audience that should be um, helpful to so many different people. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's great. I would like to, at this point, um, really bring back Hannah's passionate voice there and kind of let us know about after all of this discussion and the kind of, um, you know, marketing on the project that you have done, how do you visualize it in the future and, and how, how do you think that what, what the potential of the project is in the future? It's a really good question, actually. Um, I actually have uh, an auntie who works in public health and um, I've experienced firsthand from her accounts um, just how kind of intense a process that is and how that's what a struggle that's been. So I think one thing that we've discussed at Medina um, quite recently, actually this week, is the idea of approaching local councils um, and their outreach projects that they are working on to um, give them books, almost inspection copies and see what they can do to use their platforms. Um, to distribute books as far and wide as possible. Um, so obviously my role is quite a ad hoc grassroots level and um, reaching out on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but one of the big challenges of the project and in terms of its marketing especially is getting in touch with teachers. Teachers are very busy. And I think everyone on this discussion will agree with me, um, you know, making sure that teachers don't feel overwhelmed by the information you're giving them and when you're trying to excite them about something without kind of overloading them with information. So um, I think it's quite exciting to see um, and just echoing what everyone has said, um, who we can partner with. And it really comes back to that value of collaboration, which is why I think it was so exciting for me to be involved. I've actually had previous involvement um, with regional dementia fundraising and can having had my granny had dementia, having done that fundraising um, for a couple of years now, um, whilst at university especially, can attest to that potential uh, there, especially again with uh, reaching out to maybe care homes um, on the island. We have lots of care homes here, uh, a massive network of carers, um, adult carers, young carers, especially that's another audience. So I think for me, uh, I, from a marketing perspective, the sky's the limit and um, it's it's very valuable and it's very rewarding. So absolutely agree with what's been said and yeah, very excited for what's to come. Fantastic. That's that's great. And I think in Leicester also we have got this um, um, a, a large number of unpaid um, carers. And, and of course, I mean, there have been some discussions with the school to kind of see how that gap can be managed when kids are also growing in those families. So, yeah, thank you. This is fascinating. been following a germs journey an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications you can find us on twitter at germs journey or go to our website germsjourney.com